Hello, and welcome back to EX367 and Robotics 320. So Introduction to Autonomous Robotics and Robotic Operating Systems. This is our 17th lecture of the semester, and it will actually be our final recorded lecture of the semester. Uh, so for the, for the upcoming interactive sessions, we're going to have a set of uh, invited research talks, and then we're going to have the best use case of robotics uh, for, the, for the final week. Um, and so today's lecture is going to be our final recorded lecture the topic is going to be collision detection. Uh, so it's going to be a briefer lecture that's meant to really help with assignment six and, uh, and for your implementation of collision detection for incorporation with your, with your motion planners. Uh, and so before we get started with today's lecture content, I will go ahead and minimize myself so that we can all see the slide content. All right. So for today's lecture, really the purpose is to help with assignment six where we're gonna be looking at a motion planning algorithm known as RRT Connect. Uh, so we talked about RRT Connect and RRT and sampling-based planning algorithms uh, a few lectures ago. So for today's lecture, what we're gonna be discussing is how, how it is that we can use collision detection uh, and implement collision detection so that for our motion plan, we're able to generate a collision-free uh, plan that takes the robot from some arbitrary starting configuration to the world origin at the zero joint angle configuration. And so what that looks like uh, is going to be something like this, where, where you can choose some arbitrary starting location, which could, as long as it's a non-colliding configuration to start with, and then your motion plan algorithm should be able to find a collision-free path through configuration space that takes you to the zero configuration state at the world origin, uh, which is the, the state of the robot shown in the center of the screen. And so this collision-free motion plan is going to take the robot throughout configuration space. And in order to do that, it's crucial that along the way throughout this planning, that the robot is able to detect which potential poses would be in collision and which wouldn't be, so that it knows to only rely on the poses that are not in collision for generating this, motion, this collision-free motion plan. And so we provide a, a number of different worlds that you could use to test your, your algorithm in. And so we do recommend trying to, to test that. So to actually uh, start the motion plan, the control is shown then on this screen. So what you can do is you can pick a robot, pick a world, um, and then under the motion planning drop-down menu within the Knievel controls, you can start your motion plan by checking the persist motion plan box. Uh, and so then once you've found a plan, what you can then do is manually um, essentially kind of a tr transition through the poses of that plan by pressing the N and B keys on your keyboard in order to validate that your resulting plan is in fact collision free. And so this should work with arbitrary robots. So you should be able to uh, substitute in the different robot models that we provide or that you've created this semester uh, and still have your RRT connect algorithm work with them. So within your stencil, uh, where if you look within your home.html, you'll see the three core components that will go into, into this project. So the first component is the world in which our planner is going to be operating. So the world could be modified either on the page URL or alternatively by the script tag, which actually loads in the uh, world JavaScript file. Below that then, within the myAnimate function, there are two core subroutines that will be used for, for the running of this project. So the first is Knievel.RobotIsCollision, which is what will detect if the current state of the robot is in collision with the world. Uh, if the robot is in collision with the world, then the, the colliding link will be highlighted in red, uh, which is shown on the figure in the upper right. And then the second subroutine, which is used for our motion planning, is the plan motion RRT connect function. Um, and so we talked about this function quite a bit in the past two lab sections. Um, so I'd recommend going back and, and watching those two lab sections to, uh, to look at some, uh, some kind of tips and some details that we, uh, that we talked about for implementing that. But essentially what this function does is it's going to iterate our RRT connect motion planner algorithm uh, by one step at a time. And so these two functions then are what is going to be needed for, for the implementation of our assignment sex. So the robot is collision function is implemented within the Knievel underscore collision JavaScript file, whereas the RRT connect uh, planning function is, is implemented within the Knievel RRT connect JavaScript file. 
Um, but for this lecture, we're going to be talking about the collision detection uh, in particular. And so for this project, there's two types of collision detection that can occur. Uh, so the first type is boundary collision, where the robot might um, be sort of outside of our, of our defined workspace on the actual uh, ground plane. Um, and so in this case, we call this a, a boundary collision, and we actually provide the boundary collision code uh, for you. Whereas the second type of collision that can occur is a link collision, where one of the particular uh, link geometries is in collision with one of the world obstacles. Um, and so this is what you'll implement, and this is what will rely on some of the results from your forward kinematics. So if we look within the Knievel collision JavaScript file, uh, the, the specific function subroutine that we were talking about earlier, the Knievel.poses collision, is defined within this file, um, where the input to this function is going to be some uh, given robot configuration, and the output should be a Boolean, which, or, or, which a Boolean of false if there is no collision uh, among any of the links or the base. Uh, or alternatively, if there is a collision, then it should output the name of the link, which is in collision. And so if you look within this file, what you'll see is there's sort of two um, kind of two core components. So the first component is where we implement the world boundary detection. So this is for the base of the robot. And so this code is simply checking whether or not the, um, the planar configuration of the robot is within our defined world boundaries. Um, and if it's not, then we return the name of the base of the robot to denote that that is in collision. The second kind of component of this function, which should be uncommented by you as you begin to implement your collision detection, is what will um, process through forward kinematics the uh, basically checking if each of the links are in collision. Um, and so what this can be implemented as is uh, essentially like a, a similar to how your forward kinematics was implemented, where you iterate through, you traverse through the, uh, the URDF tree of the robot, and you test along the way each link that you encounter um, and check whether it's in collision with one, of the, with one of the world obstacles or not. And if it is, then you can stop your forward kinematics and return the name of that link. And so, and so within this, just to kind of point out, uh, the, once again, so this, this code that we provide will check the, the planar boundary of the robot to check if the base is in collision, whereas the forward kinematics that you implement should be checking for whether or not each of the links is in collision with the, with the world. And so to do that, the first thing we can, we can do is we can recall how it is that links are defined and represented within our Knievel stencil. So you'll, re you'll recall from earlier in the semester when we were discussing link geometries and transformation, uh, tr transformations applied to those link geometries, uh, that each geometry uh, is associated with, a, with one particular link uh, where the geometry is, is defined as a set of 3D vertices for that particular link. Uh, and then also the faces, the triangular faces that connect those vertices to form the actual surface. And so as a result of that representation, we have within our Knievel stencil a set of individual link geometries for each of the parts of our robot. And so these individual link geometries ultimately can be thought of uh, and ultimately are represented really as a, a mesh, uh, as a, a mesh that collects a set of triangles. Um, and so those triangles then are what we visualize as the surface of each of these parts of our robot. And so in terms of where it is these uh, these, these meshes and these triangles are actually defined. So we have object models for each of the parts. Um, so one particular object model that we're using for, uh, for the example descriptions that we give is these, are these .dae files, uh, which, are, uh, which are these collata files, which are a very common representation for, uh, for object models within, uh, within 3D rendering engines. And so within these files is actually where the set of, of uh, vertices and faces for each of the parts are defined. Uh, so if you look within the code, you'll see that we actually reference throughout the Knievel stencil uh, the particular geometry for, for the set of links that we have within our robot. And within that geometry, we then access the vertices and the faces that are associated with those, uh, with those meshes. Um, so in this particular case, we're looking at the base link, and then we're accessing the 3JS objects that are associated with the geometry which we load in from those collata files. And then within that, the reason why we access the children is because these collata files actually represent a 3JS scene. Uh, 
um, which incorporates the actual object itself, which is what we're accessing at the dot children of one, but also additional scene properties like the like the light, like an example light. Um, but within that, once we've accessed the actual object, we then can access the mesh, which is a prop, which is a ch child of that overall 3JS object, 3D object, uh, which stores the material, which is what controls the actual visual appearance, and then also, which is what we finally access, the dot geometry property, which stores the vertices and the faces. And so these also uh, correspond not only to the fetch and the Baxter and those textured models, but also to the MR2 and the example URDF uh, robot uh, and the crawler robot that we give, which have just base 3JS, uh, kind of basic 3JS geometries defined for each, for each link. And so given this representation, uh, the fact that each of these geometries are really collections of triangular meshes, we then, could, we then can, can define what it is collision detection really could do computationally, right? So we could say that collision detection is really meant to ensure that the, triangle, that the triangles of each robot link uh, do not intersect with any of the triangles of the scene objects, which represent obstacles within the world, right? So we could cast this collision detection problem as one of, of really testing pairwise whether or not triangles are, are intersecting. So how is it that we can test whether or not two triangles intersect? Uh, and so it turns out that there is a, an algorithm for computing the 3D, um, for, for testing the intersection of 3D triangles, um, where the, the input to this would be two triangles defined with, uh, with three vertices each, um, and then, which is exactly what we would have from our set of meshes for the link geometries and our set of meshes for the world obstacles. And so this algorithm then would return true if the triangles intersect, um, and it would return false then if they don't intersect. Um, and so at a high level, what this, what this algorithm would do is you could compute the plane equation for triangle two, you could compute the, the plane equation for triangle one, and then do two trivial checks to check whether or not uh, those particular, um, like the, the pair of those triangles are on um, essentially like opposite sides of that, of that plane, which would be trivial to, to conclude that, that those triangles do not intersect. Whereas if, if, not, if both of those trivial checks fail, then you can move to step five in the pseudocode here, and you could compute the intersecting line and then project that onto the largest axis among the triangles, and then you know, have like a little bit more complex geometry involved to compute the intervals of each triangle, and then, and then decide whether or not the, these intervals intersect. Um, and so this, this actually is, is quite computationally efficient for doing just a, a single pair of triangles. Uh, but the, and, and this would give you very high fidelity collision detection, right? So if you had uh, particular uh, like world obstacles or robot geometries that were very, uh, very uh, kind of high fidelity in their textures, this would, this would ensure that your corresponding collision detection had that high fidelity output. Uh, but the downside with this approach is the number of, of these operations that we'd have to perform. Right, so if we have uh, n triangles within our robot mesh and n triangles within our world obstacle mesh, then we're going to have to perform n squared triangle tests in order to ensure that there's no detection across any of those pairs. And so this can become very, very expensive. And so instead of that, what we're going to try and do in our stencils, we're going to try and reduce the number of tests that we ultimately have to evaluate. And so the way that we're going to do that is by performing a somewhat... Uh, less high fidelity test, uh, but taking a conservative approach to still ensure that we, uh, that we detect any potential collisions. So to do this, we're going to take our object models, which would be represented normally as this uh, high fidelity mesh of triangles, and we're going to approximate them as bounding spheres. So each of the world obstacles is going to be represented as this bounding sphere, which fully encapsulates the original world obstacle. The second thing then we have to talk about is how it is we're going to represent the, the robot for our, uh, for our lower fidelity collision detection. And so what we're going to do is we're going to represent the robot as a collection then of bounding boxes, where each of the link geometries uh, corresponds to a single bounding box. And so for, for visualizing these bounding boxes, we have a built-in um, we have built-in code to do that. So within the Knievel controls, if you go down to the display tab and then uh, check the display collision um, bounding boxes uh, 
uh, option, you'll be able to visualize for each of the given robots what the individual link geometries um, uh, correspond with in terms of their, their um, bounding box representation. And so for our checks, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be using an axis aligned bounding box, or AABB for short, as opposed to, uh, as opposed to the oriented bounding box, which is what you might be um, expecting. Uh, and so the, the, di the key difference is that an axis-aligned bounding box will have its height and width um, specified in terms of a specific coordinate frame. So for example, on this slide, we're illustrating this world frame uh, origin in the lower left-hand corner of the slide. And so the axis-aligned bounding box has its height and width and, uh, and then kind of center position defined with respect to that particular coordinate frame. So that's where the axis aligned comes from. Um, and so the, the advantage of doing this is that it lets us then use a simple uh, plane separation algorithm to do a collision detection test. And so using this axis aligned bounding box approach, all we need to check for is whether there's a separating axis uh, between the particular link that we're considering and, the, and a particular bounding sphere. And so the basis for this approach to collision detection relies on what's known as the separating axis theorem, which states that two convex objects are not in collision if their projection onto an axis is such that the two projections do not overlap. Um, and so this result comes from uh, a broader space within geometry, which is known as the hyperplane separation theorem. Uh, and so if you're curious, this, uh, this separation theorem applies to convex sets in uh, in Euclidean space, which is exactly what we're working with when we're considering our obstacles to be defined as, uh, as bounding spheres and our link geometries to be defined as axis aligned bounding boxes. And so to see how this, uh, how this worked, what we're really going to be doing by using axis aligned bounding boxes is ensuring that, our, that within our check, within our test, the separating axis is going to be one of the axes within the coordinate frame that our bounding boxes are defined with, res with respect to. And so to see how this works, let's consider the axis line bounding box link test against these spherical objects within the link coordinate frame. So to do this, we're going to call this the sphere bounding box test. Um, and so on these next couple slides, we're visualizing a 2D example of this test. Uh, but this extends naturally to, to three dimensions, which is what you'll be implementing for your collision detection within the Knievel stencil. And so within this figure, each of the spheres represents obstacles. So we have these four spheres, A, B, C, D. Um, and so these represent obstacles within the, uh, within the uh, link coordinate frame that are defined with a given center location and a radius. Um, and so our axis aligned bounding box, meanwhile, are going to be defined with respect to the link itself. Um, and so in the case of the Knievel stencil, that they'll be defined as a minimum along each of the three axes and a maximum along each of the three axes. So you'll have an X min, Y min, Z min, and X max, Y max, Z max, where the, the uh, indexing or the access for those, for those bounding boxes is then shown on the lower uh, portion of this slide. And so our actual test, what it's gonna do is it's gonna check along each of the possible axes um, so in this slide, it's going to be two possible axes. In your code, it's going to be three possible axes for whether or not there is an overlap of, the, uh, of these particular uh, shapes. Um, and so if the sphere is separable from the axis line bounding box in any of the dimension, then we can conclude based on our, uh, based on our separating axis theorem that there is no collision. Whereas if the spheres collide on all the tests, then we would return that there is a collision. Um, and so to sort of check this visually, what this will, what you'll have to do first is you'll have to transform the particular obstacle that you're considering into the particular link coordinate frame that you're considering, right? So each of the tests is going to be with respect to one link and one obstacle. Um, and so the obstacles are first defined within the world coordinate frame. So in order to perform our test, the first thing we do is we transform them into the link coordinate frame by using the inverse transformation uh, where the, the transformation was, was calculated by your forward kinematics. So the first thing to do is to invert that transformation, and then you can apply that inverse transformation to the center point 
of this particular world obstacle, which is defined with respect to the world coordinate frame, to arrive at the center of this obstacle defined with respect to the link local coordinate frame. And so at that point, what you can then do is you can perform our, our check of whether or not the sphere is separable from the axis line bounding box of this link in any of the dimensions. And so you can essentially implement the, the logical operations that are shown on this slide in addition to a uh, corresponding pair of, of operations for the z-axis. Uh, and so if the sphere is separable from, from the bounding box in any of those dimensions, you can conclude that there is no collision. So you can return that for this particular link and this particular obstacle, there's no collision. Uh, whereas in the case where the sphere collides on all of the tests, then you would decide that the, that particular link and that particular obstacle are in collision. So for example, on this slide, the obstacle on the right-hand side collides with both the X and the Y test in this case, and so would be resulting in, uh, in a collision. Uh, similarly, the obstacle shown on the upper right-hand side here also violates both of the uh, tests along the Y and the X. So we, we would return that it is in collision. And then an interesting case, and this is where we, uh, where sort of part of the cost associated with our low fidelity check comes into play is the example shown in the upper left of this particular slide, where in reality, there is a true separating axis, but our low fidelity check is not testing against this particular axis. We're only checking against the, uh, the axis aligned bounding box axes. Um, and so in this particular case, if you work through it, what you'll find is that in fact, this obstacle, according to our test, does collide on each of the, uh, each of the four checks that we would do on this slide. And so it would be returned as being in collision. And so even though this is an incorrect result in this particular case, it is a conservative result. So we would still uh, avoid collisions within our RRT Connect planner if we were to use this collision detection approach. And so as a result of that, we feel comfortable and confident about using this approach for our, for our robot in, in the Knievel stencil. Um, and so this is the technique that you should implement within the Knievel collision JavaScript file um, just by extending it to work for three-dimensional collision checks along the three-dimensional uh, three uh, axis line bounding boxes of each of the links. And so once you've implemented this approach, what you'll find is that the, um, the code should be uh, properly working by visually observing it, uh, highlight the, each of the links that are in collision. And so you can manually control the robot uh, to different poses within space to ensure that those poses get identified and that the correct links are identified as being in collision. So now a couple of final notes about planning visualization to help debugging for your RRT Connect implementation. Uh, so the first thing is that we provide a helper function to visualize a portion of the of the pose within your uh, within your configuration space samples. Um, so an example of this function being used is shown within the tree init helper function that we provide, where the 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 subroutine here, this add config origin indicator geom, will place a two D uh, little square on the ground plane to indicate the a portion of configuration space corresponding to the base position uh, for a particular sample within your within your RRT tree. And so this will be useful just for visualizing uh, the tree expanding to make sure that it's expanding within the local neighborhood of each of the existing samples that exist within the tree. Um, and so you can then also check once you've found a motion plan that your uh, robot is properly essentially stepping through that motion plan by stepping through these 2D ground plane positions that are going to be plotted. Um, and so in particular, once you've uh, found a plan, what, you, what uh, our helper code here will do is it'll ensure that, the, uh, that each of the particular samples that have been plotted uh, are highlighted in red so that you can visually check as you transition through the, the motion plan uh, that your robot is following the corresponding plan and that it is collision free. And so with that, the, the last piece of advice is just to make sure that you test against all the provided worlds. So we include a, a couple of worlds that have um, kind of a maze-like structure. So for example, here. And one thing you'll find in these worlds is that they're much more challenging for the RRT Connect algorithm. And so they're really good test cases to make sure that, uh, that, uh, that the algorithm is working and still able to find a path that's collision-free through the space.
Um, and so one thing you can expect is that your planners will take longer on these worlds, but they should provide very useful feedback um, as, you, as you debug. And so with that, that will conclude today's lecture on collision detection. And I look forward to seeing you uh, in class this week.